Good morning, everybody. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Thank you. Thank you very much for being here with us. Uh, my name is Isaac Scott, and I'm the founder and executive director of the Confined Arts. The Confined Arts is a program that works directly with artists who are currently and formerly incarcerated to change the narrative about their current situations, their extenuating situations, but also to work towards professional development areas, artistic literacy, and different capacity building efforts. In 2020, TCA partnered with the Center for Court Innovations and Conspiring for Good to map out and out support artists, arts organizations, projects, and programs focused on racial justice, restorative justice, transformative justice, and uh, 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 criminal legal uh, by forming this Arts Justice and Safety Coalition. So this, this coalition is made up of a number of organizations and practitioners who are all working at the intersection of art and uh, a form of justice. I uh, wanted to really briefly just uh, give some context. We have a policy goal, 2022-2023 policy goal, and that policy goal is to expand the use of alternatives to incarceration. And we would like to see that at every interval from pre-sentencing to uh, re-entry, all the way even in the prevention phases uh, as it relates to whatever rehabilitative services, therapy, entrepreneurial support, capacity training, whatever that looks like to offset uh, those issues that lead people to the criminal legal system or lead people to be more vulnerable to poverty and to, the, and, and to becoming vulnerable to incarceration. Uh, we, we, want, we want the us to be an intersecting point in which uh, capacity can be built, creativity can be a different form of, uh, of, of uh, bringing people to the point where they are able to take care of themselves. I want to choose my words wisely because this is not meant to be programmatic or systematic. It's really for the people, by the people. So we're here uh, with this policy goal. Uh, and our short-term goal has been to put together a film project, which is called Claim the Justice Narrative, which will be out in the fall. Uh, part of our long-term goals are to produce research, host panel discussions, produce writings, exhibitions, and training tools. And one of those training tools are professional development workshops. So we've been working with uh, Project Reset, uh, and this is the second of four workshops uh, meant to be able to build the capacity for those artists and arts practitioners working to mitigate the imprint of the legal system. Uh, yes, so from there, I'll stop all of my jargon. I wanted to just uh, put that down for us also on the record so you have a bit of context on, you know, who's here, how we're here. I'm going to switch my camera around in a second and you're going to see the rest of the people in the room. And before we get into anything, I think I took a little more time than I wanted to go get on to do a, just a, a brief warm up to come into the space and then we'll get right into what we came here for. So I'll pass it over with that to Sarah. Hopefully. <laughs> All right, good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining. <laughs> um, just to, oh, you know, we're gonna be talking a lot uh, today and discussing a lot and I thought it might be a nice 
opportunity to just get in our bodies a little bit first and check in with how we feel. Um, so I'm just gonna invite you wherever you are. I don't know what space you're in. Um, hopefully you're in a comfortable seat. Um, so just put one hand on your heart and one hand on your belly. And if you're comfortable doing so, you can close your eyes. If you're not, don't worry about it. Notice your heart rate. Notice your breathing. Notice how you feel. And we'll just take another moment to do this, knowing that if you would like to share in a quick go round after we move through a couple things together, your feedback is welcome. And just whatever feelings you have in this moment are welcome in this space. And I'm gonna ask you to go ahead and release the touch from your body. You can open the eyes and we're gonna give ourselves four um, types of touch this morning. You can do this anywhere on your body that you feel comfortable in doing so and where you feel like it needs it. So the first thing we're gonna do is just squeeze. So you're just gonna take your hand or whatever body parts you have available to you and give squeezing touch, right? And of course, this is if you're comfortable doing so, right? You do not have to, there's no pressure to participate. If there's any space on your body that you feel like you need some attention, give it a little neck and shoulder massage. You know, as a dance person, I want to, you know, get out my whole body, but you do what you feel comfortable with. I have to pick up a foot, squeeze the top of my shoe, right? So they're squeezing. Then I'm going to tap gently. So just very light tapping, kind of just sensitizing different areas in the body. And you're gonna reflect, compare and contrast. That's a lot of what we're doing today is comparing and contrasting things. So just noticing which type of touch you're preferring. Once you've given yourself some light tapping, like raindrops falling on your skin, the next one, this is often a personal favorite if I'm not properly caffeinated, giving myself a little <laughs> clap to wake up, right? The type of touch where you're like, I can feel that I gave myself some touch. Right? I needed that one. I went long with it. <laughs> and then <laughs> brushing, right? Lighter, softer, sort of sending. I always think of this as sending your energy into the space. So whatever energy you're bringing, you're sending it. Okay. And as you wrap that up, I'm going to invite you once again. If you're comfortable in doing so, close your eyes. If you're not, don't worry about it. And you can put one hand on your heart, put one hand on your belly. Notice if anything about your heart rate or your breathing has changed or not. Notice if the word you might use for how you feel is the same or different than before. And just take a couple more breaths here. When you're ready, you can just release your hands, open the eyes, and then if anybody wants to share either their favorite type of touch that we did, mm -hmm. or your word for how you feel, or both, <laughs> you are welcome to. And you know, if you're in the Zoom room, you can just do this, and we'll make sure that you can be heard. If you're in the real space, go for it. Oh yeah, and you can put it in the chat too. Yeah, thank you, Sarah Dean. That's uh, Zoom smarts. <laughs> Anybody in the recess room have a word for how you feel or a favorite type of touch? Uh, I don't. Uh, I think my favorite one is the rush feeling. I think it's kind of just makes your body and everything else change. Um, and I think it's nice and easy. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
I feel like it brought more awareness to my body. Like, mm-hmm. well, that felt good in the back. I think I need a massage. <laughs> <laughs> great, great. Thanks, Janine. Thanks. Yeah, let's go ahead and move on. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for participating. Okay, everyone. My name is Sean again. For those that have not met me, I'm Sean Leonardo. I'm an artist and co-director here at Recess, where we're dialing in from. And I'm just going to begin today's session by offering a bit of a recap. Pastor, do you actually change my name for me? That's amazing. (laughs) (laughs) Um, for those, for those that were able to join us or even were not able to join us for the last session a few months ago, what we really specifically focused on were the ways in which we might gather the language that best articulates our practice, the essence and intentionality embedded in our work. And so we want to elevate and continue on that path to really begin to analyze where it is that we place that heart and essence in the intentionality of the actual goals, objectives, and strategies of our work. And so today, what we will do is actually look at four case studies of strategic arts engagement projects and practices with an emphasis on work that intentionally and inherently works to be system intervention. The other way we might call that is welcome to Artivism 101. So it's in these case studies that we will take a deeper dive into how the artists and practitioners articulated their goals, objectives, and priorities themselves by visiting parts and aspects of the work that they've released out into the world. Now, we will be using something that was developed by a student of mine during a social practice class, which I led at Pratt Institute just uh, two years ago, which is entitled the social practice matrix. Don't be bewildered by the web that you see in front of you just yet. What we will do is actually map the priorities of each project according to this matrix. And we'll go around the different nodes per project. So we won't spend any time there. What I wanna bring your attention to is that this matrix as a tool of assessment is not built around a success failure framework. So we're not looking at these projects according to a spectrum of good versus bad. Instead, we're going to identify the synergies, redundancies, and deficiencies within projects, not based on lack, but instead looking at what the inherent priorities were, and therefore, based on those priorities and goals, what limitations were built into the scope of the project and its intentions. Again, as you emphasize one priority, you inherently accept and embrace a limitation. And looking at the ways that a project can therefore move and engage different priorities over the course of its scope of work. Ah, uh, yes. One second. Can you check on that, Pastor? So we'll be studying four different projects, all of which engage not only system intervention as its overall objective, but even more specifically, intervene within the carceral state, the many manifestations of incarceration and the prison system. So we'll be looking at a youth program that is, re- that is built around diversion practice, the Young New Yorkers. We'll look at a media project, When They See Us, directed by Ava DuVernay. We'll be looking at an in-prison collaboration 
that has aspects that manifest itself both inside and outside with public engagement com components. And then we're gonna look at a unique project, excuse me, that one being radioactive stories from behind, from beyond the wall. And then we're gonna look at a project entitled Solitary Gardens, which is an interrogation of the prison system, but from outside of its walls, from a distance collaboration. Let me open it up, open up the floor for just a moment and see if there are any questions at this point before I move into the first project. I'm doing my job. All right, good. <laughs> All right. So a quick study, and I'll be going first and we'll be moving around the room with each case study. A quick Apologies, y'all. The power ran. Jumped out. Turn it back. Yeah, here we go. Apologies again, we had a uh, unforeseen power outage over here. Uh, yep, okay. And we're back. Did we lose anyone? Okay, let's get right back to it. One second, y'all. All right. And we will begin with the case study of Young New Yorkers, diversion program for young folks caught up in the criminal legal system. Young New Yorkers, and again, through each project, we will visit particular their language to see what is emphasized in the ways that they articulate their goals. And then we'll try to find a few examples or visual examples of how their work is expressed, right? So young, young New Yorkers diverse young people away from the criminal legal system and partners with participants using their creative voices to transform the ways young people get arrested. And I wanna bring your attention to their own verbology, as I would call it. 
the ways in which they frame their objectives. To transform the ways young people get arrested, prosecuted, and sentenced in New York City. We do so through arts and advocacy programs, both short and long term. So start to think about the intentionality that's built in through duration. A one, two, or three day restorative arts diversion program. So they're specifically calling up the restorative, restorative practice graduate leadership programs, and the Young New Yorkers Fellowship. Young New Yorkers primary diversion program allows young people to avoid a criminal record, process their involvement with the criminal legal system, and think creatively about their choices. Think creatively about their choices. We also work with young people long-term so that their voices and actions can positively transform the criminal legal system. Through public art exhibits and events, Young New Yorkers aims to humanize the culture of courtrooms, allowing participants to be seen beyond their rap sheets. And so we see the ways in which it is expressed visually through photos. You'll see some of what is being manifested specifically in the courtroom, which is their predominant site for activation. And then we'll spend some emphasis as it is here in the website on their restorative arts diversion practice. The restorative arts diversion is Young New Yorkers arts-based program for young people facing criminal charges in New York City, criminal and family court systems. We are the preferred referral from court professionals. Our RAD program consists of a one, two, or three day structured restorative art sessions. RAD sessions are taught by teaching artists, including young New York graduates. So we have a peer to peer education model here and other credible messengers who have experience with the criminal legal system. And I'm clicking through the right so you see the types of arts work that manifests itself in the space. During sessions, participants create aspirational self portraits in which they collage photographs of themselves that represent their personal strengths and goals. Long form RAD programs culminate in courtroom exhibits where we invite police officers, judges, and lawyers, so they're naming the specific recipients, to re-meet. Therefore, they are articulating that there is prior interaction between these parties to re-meet participants in a new context and see young New Yorkers beyond their rap sheets. For the young people, this is an opportunity to use their art to advocate for criminal legal reform and be seen for their many facets, strengths, and aspirations. And their numbers are around 300 participants each year. I won't go into further detail in, in, in every single area, but again, in their order of priority, they have the Restorative Arts Diversion Program, a graduate leadership program, which invites young people to return after their session mandate in, in the capacity of mentorship. And they have a deeper engagement through a fellowship program where young people are paid to continue to activate grads who have demonstrated a long-term commitment to and passion for transforming the criminal legal system. So this is a facilitated position where they stay within the fold of the organization to assist with further, further cohorts, okay? And now what I'll do is walk you through how we will approach a strategic arts engagement assessment here. And what you will find is as we move around this web, this matrix, that one node will pull for a toward or away from another. So first I'll go around the, I'll, I'll go around the eight nodes so that it's, it is clear for all the projects that we, that we will visit today. So starting at the top, ecologically sustainable. And this, I would really focus our attention on what is being used materially. How much waste is being created? 
what is the sustainability of this project in terms of its imprint on its set? Moving to the right, participant age, participation. Do the, is the agency lended to the participants to conceive and craft the project from its origin? Is this a project in which participants are invited to co-design and co or co-author? Or is it a project that is pre-designed and therefore more of a set lesson plan? Okay. Moving down, longevity, durability, is the intention short-term or is there longer-term engagement? Moving down, intersectionally concerned. Is this a particular demographic or is it built into the intentions of the work to be able to connect and work across intersectional identities? Moving down, visibility. Is the work inherently and intentionally protective of a primary community or is part of the intentions built in to share out, to express outward with a secondary or wider audience? The scale of impact moving across, is it in terms of system intervention, something that is in a direct action, a direct interrogation, or is it more of a poetic and symbolic nature that might be narrative based that speaks to an issue as opposed to engage with an issue? And I wanna say before moving on that we will have a hard time at, at times really judging collectively where this node is where, or where the node should be placed. And that's part of the work to be able to argue amongst each other in terms of how the intentions and limitations are built in. And then moving up, agitation. Is this working with or against an institution, structure, or power? This is particularly important. Yeah. I think these are the survey yeah, like you see, really? Yes. Oh, I have to stop sharing my screen. Yeah. There you go. Are you all seeing this now? Yes. I have to reshare each time. Okay. So we're here now. We've been walking, working across. You can see the notes as they've been mapped, and we're here in this in this area of agitation, which is specifically important to how we look at these projects in regards to system intervention in particular. As agitation, are the projects working with or against the institution structure of power? And then finally, in its engagement strategies, is it working toward cooperation with its participation? So once the framework, lesson, scope of work has been built, are folks invited to cooperate based on a set of rules and pre-designed lessons or scope of work? Or is the entire process one that can move and be reshaped due to collaboration? In other words, are participants fitting into a role that has been designed for them? Or is the project continuously evolving based on who's at the table? Okay, so before I stop share, we'll actually move through this for each project and we'll start with young New Yorkers as we understand it. Now, of course, we have not been a participant. And so our interpretation, our read of the objectives have to do with how the work is being expressed on their own website with the examples that they've offered. But based on what we know, and we'll actually start with participation. And please feel free to unmute. And we'll just go through this in a matter of a few minutes. We're not meant to reach a resolve. And again, I want to point out that this assessment language is not made to judge a project based on good versus bad, but instead based on priorities and limitations. So in Young New Yorkers, we'll start here. Is the agency handed over to the participants to conceive and craft the project? Is there zero agency or is there full agency as to what the work actually is? Thoughts? And we're going to 
really lean on folks that are in the virtual space. And just, you know, no wrong answers. Um, could you please kind of tell me what the difference is between agency in this description and collaboration? So collaboration being across in the engagement? Yes. Yes. So what I would say is that this is the pre-work work. So what we're discussing here in terms of participation is the work that is meant to happen being co-authored and co-conceived by the participants, or is there something already set in place that participants move into? What are folks' thoughts? I feel like there's a lot of information on the website to come up with a quick answer to that. That's okay. What's your initial read? Are we looking primarily at RAD or at the other programs? I'm sorry, Mia? Are we primarily looking at RAD or uh, the we grad can, let's focus, Sure, we can focus on the RAD. Mm -hmm. It sounded to us more like a cooperation orientation than a collaboration. Their program descriptions are pretty explicit in at least their structure, if not their actual activities. Um, and the progression through their programming from initial participation to longer term participation seems a little predestined. Um, mm -hmm. So then that really kind of leads us to more of the cooperation versus collaboration. Right on. So we're here in the engagement. We're actually starting here. But I think, I think, uh, and what is your name? I'm sorry, who just spoke? Masters. Masters. What you're also, what you're also indicating based on the shape of the program and also based on the fact that we are speaking about a court mandated population. Let's think about also what folks are moving into, how they're moving into the program. There is a set design. It appears that the lesson plans are set and then made available to those that have been mandated in this space. So one might argue then in a range of, are, if particip are the participants actually conceiving of the scope of work, it's a little, a little unknown as to during the steps, how much agency is given over to the participants. But we do know, as Master said, that there seems to be a shape and form to the work that is already set for participants as they come in. So let's arbitrarily, for the sake of it, let's map uh, let's, let's pinpoint a five here. And then longevity. That speaks of two different scopes of work, but what would, what would folks say is built in terms of short or long-term for the RAD program? Short-term. Shorter term? Okay. Yeah, it says one, two, or three day. Thank you. Is it intersectionally concerned? And so some of this can, uh, has to be based on the visual examples that we've been offered. Are we thinking about a particular demographic? And this is as, you know, particularly true in terms of the proportionality of arrests that are happening in New York. So who are we talking about? Is it intersectionally concerned or is it more of a defined demographic? I guess I'm gonna say intersectionally based on the fact that that one picture, it's called the women's exhibition. So, and um, I guess most of the pictures in the self portraits, well, it's hard to say. Right, it's a little hard to say. Yeah. But, but we know we are talking about a particular demographic of individuals, young individuals in particular that are being arrested. So let's, let's map this out of five. And again, we're just 
we're just moving through this evaluation for each project. This is not, you know, we're not resolved on, on anything here. And actually at the end of the four projects, what we'll do is actually hold up each project against one another to look at were our decisions accurate or in the comparison, are we making different, or are we understanding the project differently? So again, no right or wrong answer here. Let's just move through the projects. And you know, I also understand that this is a bit of a warm up because it's a methodology that's being first introduced, introduced to you for the first time. Visibility, is it protective of a primary community or is it shared with the secondary audience? We know that it built into the exhibition that there is an audience being brought into the courtrooms of judges, lawyers, and police officers. So what would people say in terms of visibility? Well, it's not a like a wide audience, like a museum or something like that. So I wouldn't give it a 10, but maybe 7.5. Hannah, do you agree with that? I saw you were trying to unmute, yeah? Scale of impact, is this a direct action or more of a symbolic gesture? It feels symbolic, to be honest. Um, I think it, the, what makes me feel that way is that there's this an attempt that I, uh, my understanding is that like having the folks from the system kind of come back to meet participants in a new space is kind of trying to materialize this like symbolic transition from mm -hmm. a prior relationship to like a potentially new one, but it doesn't seem to be um, underpinned as being attached to any process of accountability for that transportation to actually be materialized. So well that said. gathering and some of the implications are more of this like hopeful symbolic transformation in the minds of the judges and not in the systems at hand. Okay, so the interrogation is not necessarily of the system itself. However, I might push back and say that it is stated that cases are being closed. So maybe it starts to push toward direct that I would agree with everything you're saying, but let's also keep in mind that the intentions are built in in a rather short-term basis to close cases. Yeah, I think that the symbolic action can have material consequence, but there if we're talking go. about the structure and intention of the programming, it's the, the methodology is symbolic. And so what number would you give it or where would you, where would you like to place it based on those two sort of um, conflicting points? Would you say a five? I'd be at like a four, 4.5, yeah. All right, all right. We can go beat a little bit here. Um, agitation, is it working with or against the institution structure of power? Anyone? I would say with. Would you give it an entire, is it entirely within the control of the system that it's working with? Or is there some inherent agitation built in? And just your impression, no wrong answers. Anyone? My, my impression is that it leans with, given that the exhibitions are taking place in the courtroom, which you mentioned is the site of activation, but re-meeting them in a new context, ultimately, like how, what, what are the bounds that are already placed upon that context that are limiting the ability to actually see beyond the relationship that already exists between participants and folks who are involved in the system. The criminal legal system, well said. And then going back to, I forget who was speaking earlier, might have been Mastris that was mentioning the engagement that it seems based on the output that there is collaboration amongst the participants to produce the portraits 
to create the ephemera that are filling the courtrooms, but that there's a, a more rigid set of parameters around what can be made, at least from what we can interpret. And so I'm gonna place it somewhere between five and 7.5, let's say. And then is it ecologically sustainable? Now, this is a tricky one based on, on this work, but what would you, for example, say is the, the life of anything that's being produced in exhibition for the exhibition? Do you think those are being discarded? Well, since it's some collage materials, I'm gonna think there's some recycling, okay. but everything is gonna be ending up in the garbage. So I wouldn't give it excellent, but it's better than like paint or something. Well said, so that, does, so that would be my impulse. Okay, so this is the shape of the project that we now have. I'm gonna to have to stop share in order to go back to the next project. All right, Pass, are you ready? I am ready. One second, y'all. And I, I think we can now open that door to let the air come in. Like, you know, people are not up here. Okay, so I'm gonna go right into this next project. So I'm gonna ask that you help me with the matching of this. Of course. So, okay. yeah. Tell me so, when you uh, want me to play. I, and I'm also gonna ask you to uh, stop me if I start to get too much information about it. <laughs> <laughs> because that's what I'm going to worry about. But I see, I'm, I'm glad that I was able to uh, see. I'm, I just was face friends. Uh, this, this particular project, uh, when they see it's very different, well, not different, but more traditional in that we, we, we experience film a lot. We, we understand the power of film and uh, what it can do. So uh, we this one may be a little bit more easier to understand and map than the, the last project. Uh, but I want to just give a little bit of context. I, I would like us to watch the trailer if people have not seen it. Has everyone, if, if any one person on this phone hasn't seen the documentary, then I would like to watch the trailer. But by a show of hands, anyone who hasn't, is not familiar with the When They See Us, Documentary project by Abu Dhabi. Don't see any hands. Cool. All right, so I'll just do a brief recap and then we can just go. Oh, honey, I don't know if you can hear me, Pablo, but yeah, I'm not familiar with this. Happy. Thank you very much, Pablo. We're going to go, we're going to watch the trailer on it. I'm going to give you context of it and then we'll watch the trailer and then we'll go right into it. Uh, so, this uh, particular uh, documentary was based on a historic event which took place in New York in the spring of 1989. Five boys of color were arrested, interrogated, and coerced into confessing to the attack of a woman, a white woman in Central Park. The project overview Alva DuVernay creates a four part documentary series on Netflix called When They See Us which depicts the false arrest and conviction of five teenagers for the aggravated assault and rape of a white woman in Central Park on April 19, 1989. So I felt like, uh, so I, I, Sean, I was doing a little bit of research, of course, <laughs> and I, uh, I, I stumbled upon an interview by Osha with mm -hmm. Alvin Duvernay, and I wonder if I can share her response to one question. Of course, go ahead. Yeah. So the, so she was asked, obviously you tell a lot of different stories, but you keep coming back to the misapplication of criminal justice to people of color. What about this story brought new understanding to you as an artist? She responds, the sprawling nature of this story forces the storyteller to have, an, to, have to understand all of the different parts of the criminal justice system in real time. So where areas I have studied those things from a historic framework in order to make 13th, which is another one of the documentary that I would suggest uh, everyone watch it. Uh, this film allowed me to really interrogate it from a personal and emotional place. Mm -hmm. All of the levels of the criminal justice system that I talk about in 13th, I really begin to feel them on when they see us. Mm -hmm. When we talk about bail, when we talk about death is prison, when we talk about solitary confinement, when we talk about police aggression, when we talk about the bias of the criminal justice system, it was digging into each of those pieces that I knew theoretically, that I knew politically, historically, culturally, and getting on the level where my heart was beating with the people going through it. 
in conclusion, I never, I never gone deep inside the prison and dealt with the whole trajectory of criminalization. The sweeping nature of the case is that it touches almost every aspect of the criminal justice system. It allows us to share all of that emotionally, emotionality, excuse me, that's bumping up against the hard walls of the system and really open up these spaces in a way that I really long to do, hadn't seen and wanted to have seen. So that's the fullness of the context uh, I wanted to provide before we go right into the mapping. Uh, excuse me, until we watch the trailer and then we'll go into the mapping of the project. Is my mom here? It's just us, you and us. Who you were in the park with? I don't know names. I just got lost. Where did you see the lady? One, one lady. The female jogger was severely beaten and raped. Every black male who was in the park last night is a suspect. I need all of them. What's going on with my son? Your son was involved in a rape in Central Park. What? No, 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 Wait a second, wait a second. They saw you rape the lady. I didn't see a lady or hit anyone. I didn't see any lady. Kevin. I didn't see any lady. I want to see my son right now, right now. Whatever they said I did, I didn't. I know what. Zoning on the road. Nothing in these boys' state matches the central facts of the crime. All we need is for one to tie this whole thing together. These tapes are not as clean as the state would have you believe. There is injustice happening here. There is not one shred of evidence. Imagine the frenzy of these teenagers. Ripping off her they are innocent of these crimes. They are guilty. Why are you doing this like this? What other way they ever do us? And I haven't looked back. I've been having these dreams. Hearing these footsteps, and they come in closer and closer. That's me coming to bring you home. They said if I went along with it, that I could go home, and that's all I wanted. The police will do anything. Lie on us, they will lock us up, they will kill us. This is my life. I don't think we should admit to something that we didn't do. Okay, we keep fighting. Thank you. So, uh, Pablo, I would definitely uh, recommend you uh, go take a, you know, just watch the series, give you a lot more context. Um, I, I, again, I'll say everyone should, you know, on this should be familiar with the 13th documentary, a lot more context into the inequalities of the criminal legal system, so just for some context. But let's get into math and when they see us. So we can start with the first, are we starting with participation or ecological? Let's start with participation. Okay, so with regards to this project, how would we map uh, participation? based on how we, you know, the standards we set for mapping on our last project. How will we, uh, the agency of the participants to conceive trash project? Do they have any agency in this? When we say they have full agency, what would we say? I mean, given that the actors in the, in the piece are not, A, the individuals that were ultimately exonerated, nor, I, I mean, it was written, I don't know who it was written by, but there was a kind of a hierarchical structure with the director, the participants were not, potentially they were consulted, but they were not ultimately the ones presenting the story, um, their narrative. So I would, I would rank it relatively low in terms of agency. Any thoughts, any other thoughts on that? Would it, would be it would be the viewer, I guess, really, yeah, most of all, right? Excuse me? The participant would be the viewer of the film, seem, most of all, so it does seem mm -hmm. rather low. Now, would we, That's is, interesting. 
is the participation. Like is, that, is that how we rank in our songs? So just some clarity. Are we ranking from the uh, audience's perspective or from the, the fabrication of the project? Well, inter interestingly, I mean, I would have conceived it as fabrication, but, but interestingly, both are articulating very similarly that the authority is being given to the director. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we we good to move on. So uh, thank you both for that. Uh, so how do we rank longevity, durability? Is this a is it something that's a short term project, or is this something that's going to live on for a long time? Also, to keep in mind, this was a four part series. Four part, yes. This is a four part series, and it's available on Netflix. Thoughts on longevity? I mean, interestingly, I think the longevity, it's an interesting question. I think this might be have, have a longer kind of lifespan given that with such a deeply felt creative project, you know, it is one that can marinate for a very long time, even if it's not quite as experiential. So almost it feels like in this case, agency and longevity are two sides of a scale. And because it wasn't experientially felt the creation of the project by the participants or the folks ultimately directly impacted, it does live longer because it exists for an external audience, which I think can both exist, but anyways. Well said. All right, so how are we ranking this? <laughs> we did it to uh, So I, I, as I'm waiting, I say, let's give it about a nine. Okay. So, I'm with him. So it's not built for the in betweens, but go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking about I'm thinking about what if Netflix decides to uh, shade. It's okay. Yeah, I'm thinking what if Netflix decides they don't want to show this anymore. Oh, interesting. Yeah, yeah sure. Things like that, like what might get into giving away the distribution in its capacity to live on. You know, that's true. But yeah. I'm archived, so I just I didn't want to give it a full ten. Seems like absolutes to me. So, uh, <laughs> how do we go? How do we rate it on intersectionality? Uh, intersectionally concerned. How intersectionally concerned is this piece? Yeah, I'm not. I'm not going to fill the space. I'm really <laughs> yeah, I mean, it seems like you're. Know, Pretty intent on telling a very specific story, uh, so I mean, it, yeah, it seems it seems pretty high on that scale. There's, yeah, I mean, that seems like there's not a lot of guessing of uh, who who it's about or or what the message is or what they're trying to expose about uh, why and how this case happened. So it seems pretty high. Yeah, telling a story, like, representing, representing a community in a certain way. Yeah, just to name it more explicitly, we're talking about the incarceration of black and brown boys. Right? So well said. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, so let's move on. So visibility. Uh, how how do we rank this on visibility? The protective of primary community or shared with secondary audiences? What is that thumbs up thing? Shared. It's a very visible. Oh, go ahead. No, you. I was just going to say, I mean, peak visibility. It is available to, to most individuals in the world via streaming services or whatever. If you have money to pay for streaming services. <laughs> right. So we still want to rank it to? Um, maybe like a nine. <laughs> you are just absolute. Being a contrarian. <laughs> <laughs> This is a really interesting question. You might want to talk, you might want to talk a little bit about the result or the, uh, the yes. outcome. Okay, great. Thank you for, for allowing me to do that. I, <laughs> I wanted to do that from the beginning, but I didn't want to get too much. So I'm going to read off something. I, I actually Reference this project in a uh, article that I wrote last year for the Columbia Spectator. And I wrote the explicit portrayal of the ruses of the New York City Police Department and Manhattan District Attorney used to obtain confessions and convictions, led to the resignation of law school professor Elizabeth Letterer, the lead prosecutor on the Central Park Jogger case. 
shortly after the film's release. So she had been still at the Columbia Law School teaching. This call to action was led by the Black Law Students Association in its call for more inclusive teaching at the law school. So uh, impact one right there after the film. So a little more context there. This, this, this uh, the Black Law Students, which had been asking for her resignation since the event happened, a little after the event happened. Uh, let me not say that about uh, at least for a decade, they've been calling for her her removal and she had not been removed. And after the film was released, uh, there was again a, a, a new call for her removal. And at that point, she did resign. Another uh, point of impact from this project I wrote in the same article. Later in the same year, while investigating the very unfortunate murder of Tess Majors, an 18 year old first year at Barnard, uh, former Mac Manhattan Borough President Gail Brewer, enlightened by the same documentary uh, and open to community concerns, concerns excuse me, she cautioned the NYPD not to repeat the same abuses with the teenagers, with the teenagers of this case. So this young lady was 18, and uh, the people uh, 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 accused of uh, committing a crime against her were 15. So they were around the same age as like these, these same young men uh, when they, uh, you know, were interrogated by the police. So the borough president cautioned the NYPD not to repeat the same rules with the teenagers they were questioning for major's murder. And Bruce's caution ultimately led to a much more humane and restorative approach to the apprehension and prosecution of the children involved in the sentence crime. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to note those two things as a point of impact. Uh, and I, I referenced in the, the fullness of the article I wrote was not to sleep on the transformative power of the arts, and that the arts does have power to have an impact. So to the extent of this uh, note, we are trying to gather uh, what would we say the scale of impact? Is this a, a direct action or a symbolic gesture? So how do we rank this one? I would say this one is kind of hard. I feel like it, it can go both ways. Okay. Yeah. Come on, speak up to that mic. Yeah, <laughs> speak up. All of those voices. Come on. Let's open it up. Yeah. That was you, bro. Say what you just said. I think, I think it's more of a direct impact. Um, direct impact. But um, I think it's more of a direct impact when you look at part of my. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Um, direct impact. Um, simply because if prior to that situation did not happen, we would not have anything left on it. We would not have anything like that one. So. Mm. We do X, Y, and Z ball, so let's go back and fix this so we don't run into the same situation again. Um, it's literally knowing history, so we don't repeat the same thing again. Mm. So having that direct impact is, I think, more symbolic, in my opinion, because the symbolic, the, the, the symbolic gesture is uh, okay, you can do it just to save face, but when you really want to impact someone, you have to really set rules, set things that then really push the scale forward. Um, so I think that's why it, was, it really made more sense to me why they more direct impact. Got it. They're influencing people's lives directly now. I mean, not making a, a law that's going to change people's lives over time, but when you impact them directly, that makes a more difference. So. Yeah, the stickiness that you're bringing up is how do we connote the changing of hearts and minds with directness? Right. Well, I mean, and also, I think the intentionality of the creator is do we take that into consideration? That's right. Because I don't know that it was Ava DuVernay's intention to have the legal implications that this did have, which was an amazing impact, but I don't know. Like, do we, do we take that into consideration too? Exactly. What, was, what was the intention and the creation of the project to begin with? That's right. That's right. That, I was thinking, thank you, Sal. Uh, uh, so we got to make moves. So we're going to give a score. <laughs> you know, I, I'm, like, I'm, here, I'm just leaning towards a five because I think okay. it's, right. it's mid-road. Yeah. All right. Mm -hmm. Agitation. So agitation. Is this working with or against the system and the institutional structures and the power? What do we think? I think it's working with the institutional power of how films are supposed to be produced, but mm. against the institutional structure of 
uh, or the, the agenda of uh, institutional racism and institutional and incarceration. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I feel like it's uh, non agitating in its art form, but it's agitating in its political message. Well right? said. Yeah. So, how would we rank that? Didn't mean to pose some, <laughs> you know, make it more complicated, but how do we want to think about this? Go ahead, Anna. I was just given a five. That to me is solidly in the middle, given that we're, we're considering the intention of the creator and there was no kind of direct legislative agenda, it seems. Got it. Uh, so engagement, cooperation or uh, collaboration? This is also a difficult one given the medium. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think what might have been left out of the description for those who haven't seen the film is what the role of those of the physical archive um, was in the creation of the, I know that was brought into the room earlier, like the question of, you know, were they consulted? Were they, what was their involvement in the writing process? Um, and I think having some of that information might help inform how we, how we view that, knowing that participation has been identified both as the creator and the audience who's in the film. Okay, yeah. I do know that the uh, that the individuals four four out of the five were heavily consulted yeah. and interviewed during the process. Yeah. yeah, and there's actually an interview as part of it too. Yeah. That's yeah. right. With Oprah. <laughs> so let's let's can we break this so we can move along? Oh, yeah. So looking at the clock. Mm -hmm. we'll we'll these projects. We'll uh, okay. So uh, is it fair to give this something high on the collaboration side? I would say about it. Go ahead. Eight. Okay, we'll go with eight. Okay, and is this ecological sustainable? I would be The film project. Uh, I'm not sure how much. Uh, Solutions place and or even material it. use. It's yeah. hard to say. Yeah. I mean, I would say the film industry is notorious okay. in terms of waste. That's not true. So in the film, is there, are there, there no explosions? <laughs> 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 this is sustainable. Uh, but, but although I don't, and, uh, although I do, I feel like it should be noted that it was filmed in the jail settings and it's doing so. Preserving the uh, spaces and aesthetics. Mm. Right. So I'm going to stop with this. I don't know what that means in this. But well said. Yeah. I was going to say that, but also the fact that you were saying about the production and the, um, the sharing of it you, is only on Netflix. So, mm -hmm. you know, I think that plays a part of it as well as if it's sustainable to continue to be shared. Well said. How would we say this? I feel like there's a really important element that needs to be acknowledged here that even if we're talking about the most basic tools and the most streamlined distribution that even if the whole movie was filmed on an iPhones iPhones are not sustainable. Even if it's only being shared on Netflix, Netflix is not sustainable. I think that there are some really severe limitations to digital art and activism that if we're not really talking about how the baseline of our capacity to even think about how to use it requires a certain degree of non-sustainability or waste, that like yeah. it's really important to be mindful of that. So acknowledging that, you know, they're, you know, that they're making what they can out of what they have access to, but also acknowledging that like those tools are inherently costly. That's right. Well said. Thank you very much, Memphis. So can we, can we just, can we land on like a four for this? Oh, I already gave it to you. Let's move on. Yeah. Thank you. Very that was perfect. I got the stop share first. Yeah. All right. Okay, everybody. Um, so uh, I was going to share about radioactive stories from beyond the wall, which I was not familiar with prior to preparing this. Maybe some of you all are. Um, 
but I, I will share and there's several little sections of the video, which is a nine minute video, but I'll just read the statement from the website um, by artist Maria Gaspar. Radioactive Stories from Beyond the Wall is a series of community engaged radio visual broadcasts located between the largest architecture of Chicago's West Side the Cook County Jail and the working class residential area of the Lawndale communities. Radioactive centers the voices of those currently incarcerated by broadcasting and projecting intimate and creative stories from inside Cook County Jail to outside its border. On September 15th to 16th, 2018, the project debuted in a large scale public art event at the North End Wall of Cook County Jail. Community members, passers-by, and members of the ensemble gathered to watch the north side wall bordering the Cook County Jail become a screen transformed by audio and animations created by currently and previously detained individuals. And I always think it's important to look at what the uh, su financial support is, supported by the Robert Rauschenberg Artist and Activist Fellowship and the Creative Capital Foundation. There were some other funders as well which are noted in the credits of the video. Um, so the, the first 30 seconds is just a briefer statement of, of this along with some images of participants. But if we jump to 47 seconds until about 102, we can view some of the participation. I did the best I could to pull out time stamps. I really- The physical it. is the forms, right? The buildings, the concrete, the bricks. What does the space make people feel? Where are the emotions? I believe just because we're in the city, they don't want it to be a sort of people's eyes, so they put a wall there instead. Freedom, justice, equality, um, and then the exit is the money. It's spitting out the money machine. And then we can jump ahead to tile flies off shows a little more of the process. I mean, there's like a lot of the process throughout it. Imagine the tick. This is not about perfection. There's no such thing but it's rather about experimentation. I'm sorry, but I can't die today. It's just not possible. I'm sorry, but I can't die today. The next jump I wanna make is um, to a discussion with prison administration. That's at 4.51 till about minute six. Always being like safety. And so I wanted to just kind of clarify those things today and, and make sure we're on the same page. For the individuals who are doing the audio, mm -hmm. is a picture of them doing the audio or are you just gonna hear the audio and see the yes, art? Yes, just hear the audio. Okay. So some of them are, are more emotionally driven. Some of them use humor. Part of what we're trying to do, and I think what we try to do for all these different projects is to really inform and educate the public about the real complexities of people's lives. While someone's memoir is powerful and it's important, um, I just don't want it to be like a bashing of Cook County Jail. There were things about the entire institution about criminal justice that sure. they had yeah. issues with, right. but it didn't necessarily call out you know, okay. the sheriff or anybody. I just want to look at like security, how things are going to flow on the day of, just to make sure that it goes off safely, um, that we've checked all the boxes to make sure that we're in compliance with all the Chicago rules. We want to use four projectors um, and use, uh, if you look at the back side. Um... And then if you jump to 711, um, there was also, I'm just going to, um, if you pause it, Sean, sorry. Uh, I actually can't remember now because I took some still shots, which I wasn't able to transmit, but of the artist and her team working separately from the participants. So I just wanted to highlight that as well. I hope that's clear. Um, but you can the I want a soul. I hear people say, 
I am tired all the time. I see people do everything. Our roots run really deep. Our history is a long one. But one thing that is for certain is that I have definitely seen it all. Do you see me? Or do you just look past my pain? That's why all of my friends' towns are breaking off, leaving slowly every day because you're our chief. Which is just a few seconds ahead, just so we can see the ensemble, just the way that the credits are. <laughs> So the sound effects are going to be nom 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 no no help the end that's that and you know the video there on the website is nine minutes so you can get more info from watching the whole thing all right let's get into it you know how long the project was like in the gentle um the dates listed for the the broadcast was just over a couple of days okay in 2018, but I don't know what the duration of the workshopping process. And there was a lot more interactivity um, that uh, between the participants. There was also, I forgot to pull out, there was a reflection by some of the participants that were talking about their experience. And I actually forgot to have you pull that up, but a couple of the ensemble gave a presentation in the prison um, talking about what they had gotten out of it. And, that was... and I can offer, because I know Maria somewhat, um, that this project is, in fact, iterative. So to answer your question more directly, while we're taking a look at the projection piece of it, there is a longer, long-standing relationship with uh, uh, the incarcerated individuals that have resulted in different kinds of projects. And out of curiosity, what about the... Um, the jail itself, like the staff members have, was there any issue, follow up issues? Oh, interesting. After the project? I didn't, um, I didn't witness any of that, um, but you may know more. Uh, you know, this is a really good point in terms of a case study. If it's not emphasized by the artist, if, if, if there was sort of follow up with staff, mm -hmm. it's certainly not being emphasized in the material that is being shared out in regards to the project. Right. So that is telling in and of itself. Mm -hmm. right. So let's go through it. Participation, agency of participants to conceive and craft uh, and craft a project, one to 10. We're gonna move, we'll have to move a little more quickly through this mapping so that we have time for one more project and a sort of comparison discussion. Well, let's open it up here too. I would say seven. I agree with that. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Why? Someone give me a why. Well, this, yeah. Or the, the participants um, were able to bring a lot of their voice into it, but the shape of the project had to be somewhat predetermined. Well said. Um, in terms of the the medium. Yeah. Got it. The participants yeah. were conceiving, but they weren't necessarily finally shaping. Right. right. So right. That conceiving versus crafting. They were doing the conception. The artist and her team were doing the the craft. Well said, yeah. I would I would like to say that um, anything that happens in a jail is um, very restricted in yep. both the participants, but also you know Maria Gaspar and her team what they can uh, conceive and um, <laughs> craft. Yep. Yeah. Well said, Mia. Yeah. Longevity. Long term. It's on Vimeo. <laughs> and also, I just want to revisit the, the idea that, as, as I know, Maria, that while this was a two day activation, that the process and iterations are actually much longer term. 
I don't know if I would give it a 10, but yeah. Yeah. <laughs> intersectionally concerned thoughts. Very particular population here. Yeah. Five. Okay. Because they might have done even population of the yeah, no, it's, there's no intention of intersectionality. Like, That's right, right, not built. Yeah. Visibility. Mm. Now think about the projections in particular, the final output. It's shared. Mm -hmm. Let's give it a nine. Oh, it's yeah. not in a museum or whatever, although it might be in museums as well. That's true. And I do think that this has had art world um, Sort of visibility. It's also yes. in the yeah. Fleetwoods book. That's right. So, that's right. Yeah. But I think the part that's important here is that inherently the visibility was part of the intention. Yeah. It was to be expressed on the outside of the prison. Um, scale of impact. This is an interesting one. Direct action or symbolic gesture? Uh, I would say more symbolic, but, uh, but I, I think uh, the action of uh, working with people who are impacted by the system to express their truth and reality is about an action. So yeah. I would uh, rank that like around five. About a five? Yeah. I feel like when we rank like the participation and looking at that agency part, like when that is high, then it's like, is there, does that kind of equal that direct action as well? Yeah, that, we'll see, we'll see. Once we hold them up side by side, we'll get a clearer view of how, how it stretches in one direction or another. But good point. Um, working with or against, this is also a really interesting one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, by way of going inside and having to work with the permissions of the institution, you're already limited, right. like that could never be a 10. Yeah. And even in the um, a part where like you hear them asking like I I don't want to bash the staff so mm -hmm. I was like yeah that yeah. it had to be filtered like, right. even if whatever was created in the room couldn't ultimately be part of the public presentation mm -hmm. if it was censored by the by the facility right. I mean, there's even a part in the trail of uh, some representative, I guess, of the institution saying, "Well, I want to make sure that nobody's going to think badly of Cook County here," so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so would we write this toward working with? Yeah. 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 Cooperation of the participants, or is it a collaboration in its process? I think more of a cooperation. Um, mm. But how much agency do they have because they right. if they're inside? If they said no, right, right. We don't know the context in which, like, was this voluntary? I mean, again, you're inside, so what is voluntary? But mm -hmm. even within that institution, was it something like this is a pre existing group that has to participate? Mm -hmm. Were they able to say yes or no? Mm, and, that's and, interesting. And, just, and yeah. also to provide some context, uh, when you injure, uh, to be offered the program is a privilege. To be yeah, because they can take it away. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's yeah. very much like I'm going to do whatever. This is an opportunity to get out of my living space. So, you know, not that everyone went there, but that is a contributing yeah. factor into whether I will push my creativity in this space versus just accept what I need to do. Mm. That's very true. But though one can argue that the content in terms of the decision making around sounds, visuals, the art that uh, ultimately built the projections mm. might have been, from what we can tell, fully collaborative. Yeah. Right. So, like, when we have both of those things, of the collaboration. Yeah. yeah. And we have both of those things simultaneously. That's right. So, yeah. mid road. Yes? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Ecologically sustainable. I guess the video on Vimeo is what the exhibition on the prison will turn into. Mm. Well, I think it's kind of high because of, you know, if this is a project that is going to be continued to work on, and maybe not like this can be an example set for another, uh, another um, mm. prison. Mm. That's great. Yeah, that the, the methodology, the technology is something that could actually be passed on. Right. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
kind of did seem like I think they were all limited, but also were using like majority of like the sound was just stuff that was already in the jail and true. Mm -hmm. Not a tremendous amount of waste. Yeah. Yeah. Although the same point that was brought up about technology applies here. That's right. Too. We're talking about projectors, yeah. we're talking about computers. Yeah. 10.5. What do you all think? It's 1125. We do have one other case study that we might be able to get through. I think if we want to compare the projects, though, it might be a place to, you know, we can certainly, I love solitary gardens, would love to lift that up, but maybe that can be something folks look into on their own time. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Sure. Yeah. So let's then in the a little bit and, and I hope you all are okay with us stretching a bit beyond 1130 for those that are joining us in virtual land. But here we are in terms of a comparative assessment. What are the learnings that we might gain here and I'm going to tell you again the pink what you see here is pink is young New Yorkers blue when they see us and that that final orange we get off that final orange is um i'm sorry it was radioactive. radioactive so again rather than comparing projects in in terms of the spectrum of better or worse let's see what the matrix is telling us and hannah you started to articulate this really well for example if there is inherently a long-term engagement that is built in as a goal, what might it do to another node? So we see in both Radioactive and Ava DeVerney that we have a long-term exposure and commitment. In both of those cases, we see less of a direct, a less of a scale of impact, interestingly, that it starts to it starts to bend away from direct action. So that might be that might be something that is an indication here that in order to sustain longevity in terms of its exposure, we're actually talking about wide visibility, but maybe more of a symbolic gesture in order to gain that, that visibility and long-term exposure. That's just one example that I'm pulling out from here. Is there anyone else that can, that can see something uh, illuminated in terms of priorities and limitations? Something that's popping out to me that I think would be really interesting is we're seeing relatively low ratings across the board with granted just three examples in terms of agitation. And I'd love to see mm -hmm what the shape looks like for a project that where the agitation rating is very high just to see where ultimately what we're losing in terms of any other piece i just think we oh. we didn't we didn't quite have that example and i'm curious as to what that looks like and do we even have those examples like what are they out there is there enough yeah. visibility that we can even be discussing highly I, agitating examples i think that's a really great example one argument i might make is that when a project starts to stretch towards collaboration with participants, when in particularly in terms of system intervention, then you start to see a higher mapping toward agitation. So when you think of activist practices, and TAMS Year 10 is a project that I could have called up that actually resulted in the closure of a prison. The, the formerly and currently incarcerated individuals and their families were activated in the, in the process of developing the work and all its visual ephemera. And, and in my point of view, that, is, that, is, uh, that starts to become an inherent priority in activating participants in order to agitate the system. Anyone else? Yeah, this is really great. I, I was almost sort of thinking that, like, uh, with, with respect to that, Hannah, that um, I think it also may have something to do with what, how we, like you said, how we define agitation. And to the extent that uh, 
you know, every most projects in order for them to function within a, a industry or in a space, they have to sort of not be too agitated. Mm -hmm. So I wonder how much is lost when we don't go, you know, when we say that, you know, when we conceptualize in projects and we have all of the radical, or well, I won't say radical, I'll say we have the most ambitious ideas, but as we shape the project, they, we begin to dull it down. And I wonder if at, if we were to uh, execute at those highest points of ambition, if perhaps we would be more agitating, mm. because we would be less mindful of the system that we're agitating. Well said. Yeah. Well, I think also we're looking at projects that do somewhat rely on cooperation of an institution in order to be successful. Okay. And so I think also thinking about other ways to conceive of those projects that maybe can work outside of those systems that need to give permission in order to you know, have access to be able to collaborate with folks who are inside, for example. That's right. The permission piece is really yeah. important here. And I also wonder like, um, if there was a project with a lot of agitation, what the longevity would look like. Right. Like, I think I would assume it'd be more of a short term. Well said. And a lot mm -hmm. of these um, yeah. kind of lean towards that durable long term project. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, because, yeah, something like that results in the closure of, an, of a facility, for example, that seems like goal has been achieved, the project might close. That's right. <laughs> At that point. Yeah. What's coming up in the chat though? There's several yeah. chats. I'm curious about those responses. Yeah, what project were you referring to, Hannah? Did I was just referring to the one that Sean mentioned that he's that led to the closure of the prison. Oh, yeah. Right. Yeah. Ten, ten's your ten. Can you just type that? Yeah, I, I mean I, I might actually yeah, I might get it wrong, but I feel um, like in my experience. Sorry, Go that ahead. are really in that number of um, you know direct action, intersectionality, and collaboration, and long term sustainability. They tend to be a much smaller operation or project or working mm. group or, or scale. And in order for them to be able to keep those high numbers, there are costs that comes with visibility. There are costs that come with how widely of an audience is kind of like invited to participate. And I feel like that maybe make it less likely for those groups to be visible in order for us to like consider in this way. Um, but it's definitely something that comes to mind when I think about a lot of the different kind of mutual aid oriented work or the more survival oriented work or the more like neighborhood oriented work or community work. Um, they're less likely to be using digital resources. They're much more likely to be doing face to face and have, you know, uh, maybe a higher sustainability in, in that kind of sense as a necessity of the amount of agitation they're doing and the security steps that that requires. Super important point, Masters. I and, and you know I've been I've benefited from having you know having done this mapping, uh, uh, you know, on top of many projects, including my own. And I would say, as you're as you're indicating, that if a project is initiated with the idea of, of handing over the agency in terms of authorship and design to its participants, it will necessarily stretch it toward long-term, but also move visibility toward the zero because it is protective of the primary community as its authors. So visibility starts to, as an intention, starts to fall off. It might regain that posture as there as the projects manifest itself uh, manifest itself in its output and its outcomes but inherent to the project once you start to really build a project from the ground up and i think mutual aid is a perfect example then you're really not concerned with the visibility of of the project to an outside community also when you have large funders they want visibility that's the right project. um you know creative capital wants everybody to see what the project looks like everyone who's giving a large funding but then if it does sort of disseminate into something that's uh longer term and that funding pool is no longer as invested you know that they move away from each other in terms of visibility too i think this is a really important part of point important point in terms of the sustainability of the project, but also in regards to its funding structure, 
one might argue that if it's dependent on a philanthropic model, then it's not going to be agitating, right. mm -hmm. purely right. agitating systems. Right. Because all we, we all know that the money comes from places that <laughs> cooperate with the very systems it's meant to interrogate. Yeah. That's all really. Let's try to give one other example before closing out. Anyone else see something here? How about something that in regards to ecologically sustainable so that we don't we don't leave that out of the mix? Most in, in, in terms of waste, whether technological, material waste, but also there's there's a way in which, and I really love this point that came up when we talk about the residue of a project, how might that impact something like durability of the project? Or how might that impact its scale of impact? Like if there's, if, if the project requires so much material or technological use for each iteration, how might that impact the other nodes? I also feel like we don't spend enough time talking about energetic waste and, mm. and really cost to be a participant in these programs and on them and how the methods or systems that we use and the way that we go about things can waste a lot of our human energy and like human mm. resources and put a lot of pressure on the relationships between participants that ultimately cost the organization energy to be able to manage that conflict and to build or rebuild those relationships. And I think we, especially when we're talking about transformative work or systems altering work or, or paradigm shifting work, that it's important to value those contributions and to really think about them equally in terms of, of resource value. And I think that often gets overlooked. Well said, very well said. And so therefore one might argue if we're looking at, e at ecology more holistically in terms of, of time, energy, effort, resources, the money it might take, in other words, for people to get to the collaboration, the gasoline that might be required to, to transport someone to the, spite, the, to the site of agitation, all of that energetic use, if we use that word more broadly, might uh, impact the longevity of a project, it might ultimately start to impact the agency of its participants if an activation is based on urgency. Because if we're talking about something that is going to be wasteful, and, and, you know, without judgment around that word, but intentionally and inherently meant to be explosive and therefore maybe maps really highly in its agitation, you're not incorporating the slowness left necessary for a long-term engagement or even really considering the agency of participation, participants in its design. And maybe that could be another node on the map. Yeah. The, the energy time node. <laughs> Beautiful work, everyone. And I wish we could, you know, continue mapping the projects, but I just want to bring your attention to the fact that where this particular case, where these case studies are, and the, the matrix falls in the trajectory of the four workshops, is that we wanted to provide this moment to be able to look deeply into existing projects that have gained visibility, that have gained notoriety, as a way to really study where it is that the priorities and limitations are built in alongside the first workshop which is how do we articulate our work? Now, the point being that in your articulation of what it is that you want out of your practice, you're also going to be further and further understanding of what your project cannot do. So it is, it is a deeper comprehension of how you articulate the priorities and objectives of your work the essence that carries those objectives and therefore being very truthful to yourself of what you're not going to accomplish in that project. And so providing the case studies as examples of how you do that for yourself, knowing that we will work toward a workshop in which we are examining your own curriculums, your own methodologies, 
your own growing practices. Okay. Anyone else want to close us out? Pastor? Uh, no, I just want to say thank you to everyone again for coming on. Uh, we will be in touch with the date for our third of the four workshops. And that one, if I'm not mistaken, will be on trauma-informed care. And this is highly important because um, there's a lot of work being done uh, with people who have been uh, system impacted and practitioners don't uh, 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 need to stay informed on our traumatic uh, uh, practices and on, on non-traumatic practices. I want to say we don't want to be putting people. I've seen some art projects that you know that really trigger people's trauma. And it's important that we know those pressure points, especially dealing with. Uh, this particular population of people who are incarcerated, and that's different across men, that's different across uh, women and, and different people who experience incarceration. So we definitely want to touch on trauma-informed care to make sure that the work we're bringing to folks is uh, beneficial to them. Uh, so with that, I'll stop and thank you for giving us another, an additional 11 minutes at the time. We really do appreciate it. And we apologize again for the technical difficulty. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Let's see this clip for a second. Yep. <laughs> 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 Hey, I was just uh, lingering around for a second. I just wanted to really honestly reiterate how appreciative I was of the session and for all of you and the engagement. I've done a lot.